Well, hello there. Thank you very much for joining me, everybody. Looking at the chat that's been going on, which has been really active. There's people from all over the place. So clearly there's a lot of interest in macro photography, which obviously I am, I am really looking forward to going through this tonight because it's something I don't do something I'd like to do, but I'm actually thinking it's something I'd like to do maybe with my mobile phone. That's hope. I'm hoping that Stuart's going to be able to, to touch on that. But again, thank you so much for, for joining me wherever you are in the world. Uh, it's good to know that the technical seems to be working. I was saying that uh, obviously last week there were a few issues with the camera. Touch wood. So far, everything seems to be uh, going well with the camera. Me and Stuart were chatting quite a bit before we went live. Uh, and there were no issues. I don't know if I'm tempting fate saying that, but there were definitely, definitely no issues. Uh, issues. Listen, I'm, I'm really looking forward to bringing Stuart in, but before we do, I've just got a couple of bits of admin that I want to go through. First of all, uh, to do with the video that I showed you uh, last week, uh, sorry, the, the live that we did last week with Brian Matias, my friend from over in Palm Beach in, uh, in Florida. Uh, really interesting, got some amazing feedback on that. People pro and people con, whether they should jump to the Lightroom cloud version. Uh, but really interesting feedback from it. And there's some good questions that were posted afterwards. And Brian's been diving in, which has been brilliant to see, to see those as well. Uh, there were some people asking what my kind of thoughts were. I'm pretty happy sticking with Lightroom Classic as it is at the moment, because if I want to share images on the cloud, I tend to create a collection and then just sync that with, uh, with the cloud. The other thing to let you know about, and this is actually somebody called, one of my actually people who's on my new newsletter group, a guy called David Wally, or Whaley. David, I hope I pronounced that correctly if you're watching. Uh, he mentioned about uh, something to do with the printing video that I did a couple of weeks back as well. And it's mainly to do with uh, people who are Mac users and have a Canon printer. And it's a Canon 100S or the 10S. Now, at the time, I said that there was no support, it seemed now, for the Canon uh, Print Studio Pro software that you would use with those particular printers. Well, David got in touch. He let me know that there has now been an update. Weirdly, it's only on the actual USA Canon website, but if you're anywhere else, obviously you can download it. So I'm gonna put a link to the download um, for that software that you'll be able to get. So you can then use the Canon software for your 100S or your 10S or whatever. And then the other thing to let you know, to say was, as always, is if you find it in your heart to, just drop us a subscribe. It just means that you're following the channel. It doesn't cost you a penny. Uh, it just should, it really should just say follow. So you get to not, uh, notified when we're doing things like this, lives, which I intend to do a lot more of these coming up uh, the next year, getting people in every single week from all kinds of different backgrounds when it comes to photography, retouching, tech, and what have you. Um, and also when I've got pre-recorded videos, you'll get to know about those as well. Um, but Stuart, let's have a talk about Stuart. I'm friend, I've been friends with Stuart for a good few years now. He's from my neck of the woods, where I originate from. Uh, absolutely incredible, incredible pro photographer, macro photographer. Let me just show you, actually, his uh, website here. This is Stuart's website. Obviously, I put the link to this in the uh, details for this live. But if I just go on his portfolio here, I mean, ju I mean just look at this stuff here. It's just, this kind of stuff just blows me away. And when I look at this, I think this is almost like scientific. I think, how on earth do you do that kind of stuff? What kind of camera do you need? What kind of kit do you need? You know, it's just uh, mind-blowing, absolutely mind-blowing stuff. So Stuart's going to be talking about the kit that he uses. He's going to show the process, all kinds of stuff. Obviously, we're limited for time. But before I bring Stuart in, let me just play you this short video. Welcome to my tiny world of macro photography. I love capturing the intricate beauty that lies within the small and often overlooked aspects of the natural world. Through my lens, I reveal a hidden universe that exists right before our eyes, inviting you to appreciate the extraordinary details that are easily missed in our fast-paced lives. My name is Stuart Wood and I invite you to join me on this journey of exploration and discovery. Through my photographs I hope to transport you to a realm where the tiny becomes grand, the intricate becomes breathtaking and the overlook becomes a source of wonder. I look forward to sharing the beauty of the macro world with you.
I mean, you've got to admit, that is seriously beautiful stuff. Now, I'm going to bring Stuart in in about 10 seconds' time, but I just want to kind of let you know that we could have quite easily had an excuse to cancel this evening, purely because Stuart, I know, has suffered with the deadly lurgy, the Christmas lurgy that most people kind of suffer with this time of year. He's got it. So bear with him. You know, he might have a little bit of a cough every now and again, but uh, I, I think, you know, all credit to him. He did not want to let us all down. So I'm going to bring Stuart in now. So... Stuart, good to see you, mate. Yes, thank please. you so much for joining us. Even though I know you're not 100%, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's a, it's a tick off the bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. I mean, you can see, I mean, the, the work there, we've, we've seen your work. You've been, how long have you been doing the macro photography? Uh, since 2016, I've been doing macro. Yeah. Right. Okay. And of all the different genres that you could have got into, I mean, I look at your stuff now, I think, God, I wish I did that. What 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 is it that made you go for being doing macro? Um, well, actually, you reacted to it when I announced I was coming back to photography. You probably don't remember it on Facebook, but I had a two year period where I just put the camera down and didn't didn't touch the camera at all. And then I announced I've picked up the camera again. You gave it a thumbs up, and basically the only thing I missed was macro. And um, a lot of my followers know I've suffered from depression and anxiety in the past and macro means i don't have to leave the house if i feel like i don't want to leave the house and that's basically right. where it all started was in the studio you know but then as i get better my photography got better i started going out the house more and then eventually going to nature reserves and all kinds of places like that you still get weird looks but i don't care no more <laughs> well i mean i'm i am genuinely glad that you started to you know came back and did it because the work mm. is beautiful it's absolutely beautiful so i can see already from Thank the you. comments that we've had coming in before we went live and now we are live there's all sorts of stuff i see brian's asking you know wants to know about how on earth did you photograph them and they didn't fly away certain insects so yeah. I guess we'll cover all one that. Thing I, yeah, we'll cover all that. But I guess, you know, people have seen the portfolio. We'll obviously see more images, I'm sure, as we go through this. But, Stuart, first of all, the, the question that us as photographers, we always want to know, yeah. what kit are you using? What kit would you generally use for doing this kind of stuff? So I, um, I have two go-to kits, depending on the type of macro I'm doing. So I'm going to cover the first one, which is a full-frame setup, which I have. Right here. So this is uh, this is my Canon EOSR full frame uh, camera from Canon, and this uh, a bulk of my work is done on the full frame. And I have a one hundred millimeter macro lens on here. This is from Laura, and it gives a two times magnification, which means the closer we get, you know, the the more interesting it gets. You know, um, and I didn't start on this. I will show you an image, though, of where we started. Mm. So if you just switch over to my screen, you can see there's three images here that um, that are my favourite. None of them took on the Canon, coincidentally. <laughs> but it wasn't always like that. And I really like to show this image. And apologies to anyone who's seen this image before, but um, most likely there's people that haven't seen it. I want to show you my first macro image that I did. <laughs> and this was taken on my wall outside, and I posted it on social media and wondered why I didn't get no likes for it. Uh, well, basically because it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> but at the time, I thought it was absolutely brilliant, you know. And um, it was through the the lack of interaction that I learned that I wasn't very good. And that's when I decided I'm going to go all in, learn macro, and do a YouTube channel. So basically, that's where it all started was with that image, yeah. And um, that's, uh, I upgraded a couple of cameras um, from that up to the full frame because we're always told full frame is the best. Beautiful right. looking images, get dreamy looking images when yeah. you're wide open on a macro lens because there's the, the depth of field is so shallow. That you just did get you, did you mention there, Stuart, the, the actual macro lens you've got? Because I used to have one. I, I got one yeah. during the COVID times it's... when I, you know, when we couldn't go out, I thought I would give yeah. a go at macro, but. I very quickly yeah, realised one... it, it's more than just pointing a, a macro lens at an object. What, what, <laughs> uh, what lens it's, have you actually one got is, there? Then? This one's the lower. This is the lower 100 millimeter uh, macro right. lens, and yeah, yeah, it's yeah. one of the sharpest macro lenses I've ever tested. I mean, it is absolutely pin sharp. 
and they're budget friendly as well. This one only uh, costs about four hundred pounds, I believe, because it's a fully manual lens. And well, as lenses go, that's a good price. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not taking size, but if I had to choose between this and a Canon, I'd go with the lower every single day. I really would. Right. <laughs> um, but uh, a lot of people ask the camera what lens you you take, but those aren't important i'll be completely honest with you they're not important the important part is the light that's the important part because that okay. that is what makes the magic happen so on this particular setup i have a godox mf12 twin macro flash right with a custom made diffuser so you won't be able to buy that anywhere i, uh, I made that myself because there was no diffusers really available for the mf12s and I, I, you're going to hear it a lot tonight light is key when it comes to macro photography, because as you magnify or zoom in, however you want to call it, you lose light. So even in the middle of the day, even if the sun's out, you can still struggle to get enough light to get a correct exposure. Because the other factor as well, as I said, the depth of field is so narrow, you can put your f-stop up to narrow, uh, to increase your depth of field. But again, you're losing light again. It's all about light. Right. So... Yeah. I, there's lots of uh, photographers out there that use natural light and they're fantastic. I went with the way of flash because then I can completely control the light from this setup and it gives right. beautiful results. Um, let me show I mean, you is, an is image there, that was done. Is there, I mean, yes. just, just quickly before you do that, Stuart, before you jump onto yeah. showing us an image, you mentioned there about that, that modifier you've got there is a custom made mm. one. Yes, it is. If people were wanting to get into doing this kind of stuff and they didn't have a custom made one and they wanted to buy like an off the shelf one, is there one that you would uh -huh. say? Because obviously in the video, I think we saw a different one that we were using in that yeah, rig there. Yeah, what kind of a setup on, would you say? Um, that's on my second setup, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, All right, okay. Because a lot of photographers, when they try macro, they'll have the standard flash, which is on the top of your camera here, rather than the Pacific twin macro flashes and it all comes down to personal choices to which one you like there's not really much difference it's just personal choice um but yeah that that is custom again because you couldn't get any diffusers the only diffusers that were on the market were individual diffusers for each flash head because there's two flash heads on here but right. the problem is you get two reflections then in insects eyes and i didn't like that look again it's just personal mm. choice so mm -hmm. I made the custom diffuser so that it was a single reflection in spider's eyes, which I look, I really like the look of that single type of reflection. Yeah, yeah. Um, which if I bring up something like that, there you go. That is a shot from that setup, wow. which is the uh, the Canon EOS on the lower EF. I mentioned it, it's the EF version, even though I'm on an, an R uh, system. Because right. with the Laura, the EF 100 millimeter is the only lens they do that has auto aperture. So okay. in case anyone doesn't know what that is, basically you set your aperture in the camera and then when you take the picture, the lens aperture closes down, takes the picture, then opens back up. And it really helps with focusing on macro because you're so dark, you need every little bit of help you can to get your focus right. So, oh, that was the full frame. Okay. However, this year, um, I decided that I wanted to go in the direction of high magnification insect photography with as much detail as possible. Mm -hmm. And those are the images you've been seeing for the last six months, if you follow me on um, any social media. So I took the leap and I went with a micro four thirds camera, which is so much smaller than right. my full frame okay. camera. And there's a lot of added benefits for micro four thirds if we're just talking the sensor size the sensor size is half the size of the full frame which means you get better depth of field which for macro right. is an added bonus because okay as any bonuses we can get <laughs> we'll take <laughs> it you know what I mean? yeah. um it's lightweight as well because i'm not getting no younger and carting around the full frame one was starting to get to me where i get halfway through recording a video and i'm starting to get out of breath, get tired, right. thinking I need to go back home. But this is really light. It's like, I think it's a quarter of the weight of the full frame camera. But this doesn't have a twin macro flash. It has a standard flash on top. And this is what we was going to talk about just, which is the diffuser. Again, light is key. Light is so important in macro. And just like you would do in a portrait studio, you want to 
put a modifier on your light because the bare flash from uh, the flash is just, it's horrible. Mm -hmm. So what you want to do is soften the light. And this is the difference that this diffuser gives. On the left-hand side, we have a bare flash. And there's two things to, to notice here is the shadow underneath the spider and the reflections in the spider's eyes. He looks evil. Yeah. <laughs> he just looks evil. Yeah. But then the image on the right hand side is with the diffuser. You can see the nice soft shadows and the nice reflections in his eyes that makes him look like a bunny rabbit. It's just cute. Yeah, I, I, I totally get again. what you're saying. Looks there, like because, a <laughs> yeah, with those with the ones where there's no modifier, it's almost like little pinpricks of light on the eyes yeah. as opposed to yeah. just nicely lit eyes. I, I, yeah, I totally get that. It's, in fact, um, the modifier gives the eyes more shape by the looks of things as well. It does. It does. It, it, it gives nice, soft light. And it's the same as if you talk about any type of portrait. You always want a nice, soft light in portraiture. And I'm sure that's what you use on, on yours. And it goes yeah, exactly yeah. the same for macro. You want nice, soft, diffused lighting. Yeah. Uh, this particular diffuser I'm us using here is the Cygnus Tech Diffuser. And I can safely say that the diffuser is probably the most important part of this setup because without that, it doesn't matter how good your camera is, you're going to get bad shots because the light is just too harsh and it's just not very flattening. But, I mean, right. Um, One thing I, I will say as well is... Um, Obviously, when when this video is finished and it's actually the recording is live up on YouTube, we'll have yeah. some links into the stuff that you are mentioning, but also mainly yeah. to send you know to, on your website because I was having a good browse around that today and I noticed that you've got the portfolio, you've got the videos, you've got the the gear that you use, yeah. so people yeah. can find all that on there as well. So yeah, don't worry the, too much. Everybody gear is on, on the website, yeah. All the gears on the website, um, brilliant. Okay, and also obviously because of being a YouTuber, this is always changing. Um, yeah. So that particular page on my website is always updated to the latest stuff that I'm using or testing. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, but this, I mean, I absolutely love it. You know, I really love this. And if I'll be honest with you, I mean, I'm someone's probably bound to ask, what would you have? Um, you know, if I had the money, if I wasn't a YouTuber, I would sell everything here and just go full in on OM systems for macro because currently, at the time of this live, OM yeah. systems can't be beaten for macro photography for a number of reasons, which we will point to later on tonight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Now, listen, I, obviously, I know that you've put some stuff together to be able to, so you don't forget what to tell people tonight. I know you've yeah. spent quite a bit of time putting like a keynote thing together. But one thing I noticed there, when you're talking about kit, and I think there was somebody actually, I forget, forget the name, but they're, they're from the Cayman Islands. I saw their name come up from Cayman Islands. Um, right. But one thing you've not mentioned, Stuart, is... A tripod and obviously you know you're talking about handheld stuff there we see on the video yeah. you're doing it handheld is that something that you do or is it kind of like 50 Nin 50 yeah 90 percent of my shots is handheld on live subjects right uh, okay. i don't i mean there's a lot of photographers out there they'll shoot dead insects now i'm not i'm not someone who's going to go you can't do that uh, at the same time it's not something i do i always photograph live subjects out in the field as much as possible. I've stopped actually you know, photographing them in the studio as well. Do you know what, Stuart? It's just made me think of something. I remember, because I know Brian, I think my mate Brian Jukes, is, he was asking in the Brian. comments there before we went live. <laughs> he was saying about how does he photograph them they don't fly away? But it made me think of the, uh, the, the uh, magician, David Blaine. He used to do yeah. a trick where he would have these, he'd, he'd have some dead flies in his hands and he'd pass them on to people, and he'd, they'd hold them in their hand like this, and he'd kind of do all this, and eventually these flies that were apparently dead would come alive and fly away. But I, yeah. you, I then heard, and they showed this, that they put the flies, he's talking like blue bottle flies, I guess, you put them in yeah. a freezer, and it completely yeah. knocks them out. So when they it look, does. they look oh, dead. But then the, yeah. the heat of the hand was warming them up again, then they were flying away. <laughs> I thought... That's exactly how it's done, yeah. Oh, so we, oh right, okay. So if you're gonna, yeah, exactly, <laughs> I am right then, that, so that's, that's how, how I, you would yeah, do it. That's how I feed my jumper spiders when I have jumper spiders. Unfortunately, I don't have any at the moment to show you, because uh, okay. I always get asked, how do you feed them without the flies all getting out? Well, you bum bum them in the um, in in the free, freezer, right? They get knocked out. It's usually around four to five minutes. They're knocked out. You pick them up, stick them in the enclosure, and they wake up, and that's it. 
Drum so, <laughs> so in case there's any, I mean, I'm an animal lover, yeah. all right? So yeah. that doesn't harm them. It literally sends them to sleep, doesn't it? That's what it does. Yeah, yeah it does. Okay. Yeah. But, all right. um, yeah. <laughs> I don't do none of that for my photography. It's all of my photography is natural out in the wild. Right. Either, obviously, if it's wild uh, insects, it's all out in the wild. If it's a pet jumping spider, and obviously that's done in the studio with my pet jumping spider, but most yeah. of my pet jumping spider stuff is done to test lenses that get sent me for review. Uh, Lauer send me a lot of lenses to review. So the first thing I do is I test that on my pet jumping spider to see you know, if there are any issues because it's a new lens. You want to test that. Mm -hmm. And then if everything's okay, then I'll take it outside and just do everything on live insects out in the wild. Yeah, Lee Churchill but, quite um, rightly has just put. It depends how, on how long you leave them in there, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> whether they yeah. go, go actually, beyond sleep. Is what is what Lee's Yeah, they, if you leave to, them in so. there too long, they will they will die. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, that, okay. Well, listen, I, listen. That, let's, I, I, let's, yeah. I want to I want to dive in because I know what I'm. You know this stuff. We don't, or a lot of us don't, I guess. <laughs> you've you've shown us the kit you're using. You're talking about walking mm -hmm. around handheld. How you can actually photograph some of these insects and stuff. But settings. There you go. There's something that people yeah. always. And I know when people ask in portrait work, what were your settings? It's very, it's very location dependent, environment dependent. Depends on what the lighting was like, where you were. Are there settings yeah. that are specific? Go to for macro, or is it, or I is it location go -to dependent? Settings, but right. it will change depending on the subject. It's going to change depending on the lighting, and it's also going to change depending on the magnification you're using. Because as I said, as you magnify in more, if you get to two times three, four times magnification, your depth of field is changing. Your light is getting less and less, so you're gonna to have to bump up your ISO or increase your flash set settings to uh, to compensate. So. First thing I would say, if you are getting into macro, is to learn your exposure triangle because it is so important. Right. Because unlike a model or a World War II veteran, you haven't got time to sit there and go, oh, hold on a minute, let me just try this setting or try that setting. Yeah. You've probably got one shot and they're gone. Um, half the time when you take the, uh, the, the image with a flash, it will scare the insect and it's gone. So you have to be very quick and you need to know your exposure. But... Uh, on, a, on a full frame camera, I can say to you uh, F7 to F11. Okay. You want a shutter speed that's going to freeze the action because most of the time the insects are moving unless you do the nighttime macro. And then ISO is whatever ISO gives you a correct exposure because with modern DNI software, I'm not really fussed about cranking up the ISO, to be honest with you. Right, yeah. Yeah, very different no. nowadays to remember my first Nikon D200. If you went to 800 ISO, it was like pixelated, <laughs> yeah. like you wouldn't believe. But nowadays, I know, we can really push it, can't we? So We can, we can, yeah. Now, you um, mentioned, you micro, mentioned flash, sorry, Stuart. On, you mentioned yeah. about a single shot, and it might scare the insects away. I don't know if everybody caught it, but certainly when on that intro video that, that you kindly put together for us, when, it was, when you were out yeah. there taking the shots handheld, I didn't see just one flash. I saw like a, it was almost like a, b -b 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 a strobe effect, yeah. if you like. Yeah. Is that, yeah. Is, what, what's actually happening there? Right. So one of your enemies when it comes to macro photography is depth of field. It is very, very shallow. And again, the more magnification you do, the less and less it gets. So one way of getting around that is to do focus bracketing and then focus stack the images afterwards. And it's one of the reasons I switched to my Olympus camera because it has built in focus bracketing. And what focus bracketing is, is basically the, when you tell the camera to start taking a, a series of images, it will adjust the focus very fractionally to give you a whole bunch of images at different focusing points. And then in software afterwards, we can take the just in focus areas, the sharp parts of that Im image, and blend them all together to create one seamless image that looks like the whole thing is in focus. Right. And you don't you don't have to go out and buy a kit to do that. You can do it with every camera. The only difference is if your camera doesn't support auto focus bracketing, you just yeah. have to turn your focusing barrel manually, which is it's, it's easy to do. You can do it. Um, people get fixated with auto versus manual. Uh, what you want to look at, if you want to get into that type of 
um, focus stacking is look at your hit rate, as I like to call it. The hit rate that I like to call is how many successful shots you get with a specific subject. Right. Um, let me do some basic maths for you. You've Actually, got an it's, good, it's good. It's good you mentioned that there because <laughs> Anthony Crothers has just said, keeper "What would rate. you say is your keeper rate?" Probably so one. I guess that's kind of linked <laughs> into that. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll be showing you some images in a bit, and I'll tell you how many I kept out of them. Um, but you've got to remember that the images I take, if I've got two thousand images, for instance, there might only be maybe five images that are actually take because wow. they're all focus stacked images and you, you know if you're taking 100 or 200 images per click uh, it soon builds up over time um okay yeah but like i said hit rate it's all down to your flashes recycle time and your camera's frames per second okay so if i've got an insect it's it's on a flower and let's say that insect is going to move in two seconds but I need 20 shots to get a successful stack. I need at least 10 frames a second to get that stack. And that's why I changed because on this particular camera, the ESR, when I set it up to continuous burst mode with the flash, I'm getting around five frames a second. On the Olympus, I'm getting 10 frames a second. So right, right there, that doubles my hit rate or success rate of getting a successful shot. That makes sense, yeah. Also, yeah um we even use the focus bracketing when we're doing a single shot because as you take the shot it's altering the uh, the focus and you're guaranteed to get at least one where the eyes in focus <laughs> so having that feature has helped out a lot but again you don't have to have it you can do it manually with the um the cameras which is where um i want to come on to a bit of a rant <laughs> so, okay rant alert, careful now careful <laughs> not every camera is made equally and price is not a factor okay right. um as of the time of this particular live um canon nikon and sony cannot trigger a flash while doing auto focus bracketing so right okay yeah so just because your camera says it can do auto bracketing, um, it, you can't do it with a flash, unfortunately. It's it's okay. something, Glenn, you might know this better because you are technical uh, when it comes to cameras. <laughs> it's something to do with the fact that when you're doing auto bracketing, it's using the electronic shutter. And a lot of cameras can't trigger a flash with an electronic shutter. Right. I'm, right. I'm going to say, just, yeah, that's right. But I know, I know that my mate Krish, <laughs> I saw my mate Krish, yeah. Uh, he's in that he'd know he, he knows he's he's very technical yeah. he knows all that I mean, stuff. I, I'd love to know just to ask a techie just why is that why can't we why can't we go into focus bracketing let's say on a Canon camera like an R5 which does have focus bracketing why can't yeah. we go in there and select to use a uh, a mechanical shutter while doing bracketing that way we can use the flash I don't know hey, mate, um, it's, it's it's stuff like this it's it's pushing this kind of stuff out there that what people want, which which makes yeah. these companies do these, you know, make these changes. So who knows, exactly. Stuart? You might have just changed it. You never know. I am. Um, <laughs> I'm on a mission to to get it changed. You know, because um, right. it'd be nice. It'd be nice. Yeah, but yeah. yeah. If we have a look at my screen now. I'm going to show you the difference between a single shot and a focus bracketed shot. So on the left, okay. you have a single shot, and you can see the sliver of detail that you've got with the depth of field. And then on the right, we have the um, the compiled image, which is, if I remember right, 99 images to get that shot. Wow. Okay. Which brings us on to the subject of how do I get 99 images and the subject doesn't move? Well, well I'll tell it's you what, simply. before, before, <laughs> before you yeah. tell us, let's have it right. on that bombshell. Let's just wait there a second. Let's just have a quick break, give you a chance to get some water down your throat, because I know obviously you've got the cough and stuff. So let's just take a quick commercial break. This one is going to be from Westcott. This is the company that make uh, the background, the signature series background that I've got, the great canvas background. And this is the Xdrop Pro.
All right, I just, I just wanted to show you that quick uh, video there showing that X-Drop Pro. So I do get asked about that when it comes to my portrait work. The, that's made by, like I say, FJ Westcott, based in Ohio. And I often get questions asked from people saying, where can they get it when they're based in the UK? Carmarthen cameras. I'll put a link to them in the description part of this video as well. But getting back to Stuart, what was it that you were going to show us, mate? What was you going to talk about? You know, you're going to like it or you're going to hate it. <laughs> okay. The key to getting really successful stacks is to go out in the middle of the night. <laughs> okay um my most successful shots have been done at 2 a.m in the morning because insects are exothermic which means they're cold-blooded and just like with uh, the david blaine thing as they get cold they don't move so if you go out at 2 a.m in the morning they're not going to move it doesn't matter how many times you you flash a flash at them they're not moving. That's two the key, in the morning. Man. It really is the key. <laughs> two in the morning. Yeah. This um, face goes to bed at nine. At two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> like uh, if we get together, you're not in bed at nine, I'll tell you that. <laughs> if, we're, if we're doing any macro together, we're going out at three in the morning. Yeah, I'm glad to like clarify that. that. <laughs> um, but yeah, and that's when I would use a tripod because okay. you've got time to set up the tripod. You've got time to put the camera on, adjust the ball head, get it all in frame, get the magnification where you want, because that insect's not going nowhere. It's just sitting there. It just doesn't care. Even if it wanted to move, it couldn't. It's just, it's too cold for it. And that's in the middle of August. So um, any, any night, any night in the year, you got an insect out. Obviously you go and scout out first where your subject's going to be. Mm -hmm. just, just go out there in the middle of the night and yeah are you there, can just, are there particular you can stack kind away of, as much as you want is there anything in particular about an area that you would go to i mean would you go to just any old woodland or would you look for a woodland where there's maybe some kind of uh, a water source as well is that kind of stuff that would be good generally it's here's the problem because i actually work with the wife on the youtube channel so when we're doing anything it's mostly for for youtube content so I usually scout out because you don't want to be going somewhere you've never been in the middle of the night because it's pitch black. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Uh, there are dangers concerned, which you know, I'll get this out there now, which is why I'm not ever going to do a workshop in the middle of the night because it's just, it's mm. too dangerous sometimes. Uh, so I would generally go out, scout out an area in the day, uh, take a couple of single shots of subjects, find something I like, and then I'll go back out there um, when the weather permits. Obviously, mm -hmm. in England, that's 50% chance. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So just kind of getting this into, in my head, in a logical kind of order then. Obviously, you're talking about, we've talked about the kit. We've talked about the stacking. Yeah. We've talked about the little tips and tricks regards to keeping the insects still. Uh, we've talked about, you know, like I say, the settings as well. So the stacking side of things is there anything that you can because that was a question i saw being muted about and by the way folks if yeah. those of you who are posting questions i am keeping an eye on those we'll come to those in a minute we'll we'll get Stuart yeah, to, we'll get to, to run through those but the actual stacking side of things then is there anything that you can either tell us about or show us maybe to do with stacking is that something that we can go through yeah um i've got a slide here that we can look at okay. um this I'll is the stacking software I now. personally use, which is uh, Helicon Focus. There are others out there. You can do small stacks in uh, Photoshop, but Photoshop won't handle large stacks. It's not the best software at doing it. But Helicon Focus, I have found, is brilliant at stacking. Once you go into the settings and change the settings to, uh, in the settings, there's an area where you've got auto alignment. And I changed my settings to 25%. That gave me a lot of successful stacks then because the software is able to uh, adjust the images to basically get the stack. It will also um, alter the exposure as well because a lot of flashes, they're not consistent with the exposure. Let me show you what I'm talking about when it comes to um, the exposure, just in case anyone's had it. So... This is a folder. This is actually from the night of um, that damselfly image that you printed out for me. All right. And we okay. have, I think it's around 2,000 images, something like that in here. But if you can see here, you can see how the exposure on the images is not consistent. And this is a, um, a Godox v 350 o and it's, not, it's never consistent. But the stacking software will adjust the brightness for you as well so it's very forgiving when it comes to um lateral movement and exposure 
the only thing you don't want to do if you just come back to me uh, you can move up down left right uh, what you don't want to do is tilt if you get any tilt in right. there you're going to get like a weird artifacting on your stack because you're not looking at the same place okay. so what you want to do is i usually tuck my elbows in if i'm out handheld uh, grab underneath my lens like that that way i can yeah. adjust the focusing if i want to and just really get steady plus this camera has in body stabilization my canon didn't which is another reason to upgrade and the fact it's nice and budget friendly um <laughs> but yeah you just you get used to it if you know it. it's it's like i don't like it when i say you get used to it practice makes perfect sure and like i'm sure everything. it's with yeah. any type of photography is practice makes yeah, perfect yeah. the more you practice yeah. the better you get but once you've done that and you've got all of these images you can just take those into helicon focus and it'll stack them for you but i do want to give you a little bit of a tip okay. um typically when we're doing our stacks we'll take a stack half the time the insect will move and you just stop doing your stack and you do it again and in between there you'll get enemies like this is where we take a picture of our hand so we can signify okay. when a new stack starts well we don't have to do that no more <laughs> okay so i'm going to show you something here a trick in uh, lightroom classic because you can't do this in the um the cloud version well, if i select one, all of my there's images another one against lightroom <laughs> <laughs> yeah if i select all of my images what i can do here now is i can go to my menu go to photo go to stacking and then down the bottom we've got auto stack by capture type this is a godsend for macro photographers brilliant i click on that set it to one second what it's going to do then it's going to analyze the images and any image that's been taken within one second of another image it's going to automatically stack it we'll do that and bang all of my images have been automatically stacked into wow. stack okay. you can see here yeah you can see here just how many shots I did do of that damselfly before I got a stack I actually liked, which I believe is this one here. So obviously you'll recognize this one, Glenn. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, um, that tip saves a lot of time when trying to organize Fantastic. your files. And again, it's only in Lightroom Classic. Um, I haven't found a way of doing that in the cloud version yet, unfortunately. Right. Now, that now I know obviously there you're, <laughs> absolutely I can see that absolutely yeah the um I see obviously that you're using Lightroom there yeah is I think well, I know we briefly touched on this before we went live me and you were chatting about the software because I'm all about the software what you were using and oh. obviously I think you said your choice of software preference if you like is Helicon which I'll put a link yeah. to in the description but what was it about Helicon and Lightroom that that isn't the same as with the other software what i liked about helicon is i can export directly from lightroom, lightroom into helicon whereas the other software uh, you have to export to your hard drive and then import them into I'm the software you. that's yeah. one reason why i liked it it's just a time saver you know um and let me give you the full uh, workflow for me sure um, yeah. we, we photograph the stack out in the field or in the office bring it into lightroom i then color it in Lightroom first, because uh, a lot of my presets that are on my website, <laughs> they work better <laughs> with a war file. So I colorize it first. So if I, um, if I bring up this image, these here, uh, yeah, and here's an interesting one where the flash didn't go off. Okay, I'll, I'll right. let you know how we get around that in a minute. But literally, we'll just colorize it like that. We then export that into Helicon Focus, stack it in Helicon, we then uh, save the output files as TIFF files, bring them into the Photoshop for the cleanup. Because typically when you're stacking, there's three different methods when it comes to Helicon Focus. Um, let me just bring this up here, which I can't for some reason. Anyway, we have method A, B and C. Mm -hmm. And I usually render out all three and then I choose which parts are the best from those individual frames. And then we get into the standard cleanup, which is with the, uh, is, it, is it the remove tool, that one you showed a few yeah, weeks it is. ago? Yeah, Oh, yeah, that yeah. is absolutely magic. You can use that on the compound eye of an insect, and it will even work on that. Whereas yeah. any other tool beforehand, we've got no chance. 
Yeah. It's interesting but you it's interesting you mentioned awesome. about the remove tool there, Stuart, because obviously it is a fantastic tool in Photoshop. It oh. really, really is. But I've noticed there's been a few videos posted all around YouTube talking about the remove tool fingerprint, the little kind of mark that it kind of leaves. Now there is, there is like a little thing, but it's so you've got to really chimp, I think, to be able to, to notice it and really analyze the image. But I'd imagine yeah. using the remove tool in your kind of images, because we're talking about such intricate small areas where you are using it, it isn't going to be as noticeable anyway if yeah. there is any kind of fingerprint. So I think that's um, if you're removing a large area. Um, yeah, yeah. We're talking about specks of dust on an eye. Right. Yeah. Um, generally, I've had no problems with the remove tool. With that, yeah. with that Helicon software, Stuart, I've, I have dived onto the, the Helicon website. And one thing I've, I've noticed is there's, there's different versions of it. You've got the light, you've got the middle one, then there's another one. Do you, I mean, I'm just, I know that I'm kind of chucking this out you unexpectedly here, but do you know, would the light be sufficient or is there something about that that you would I've... go, no, don't go for the light, go for the other one? <sighs> The only reason I've gone to the pro is to teach it. That's literally all it is. Um, right. So if if I can just you take over for two seconds. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm going to uh... throw a couple of images into um, Helicon. All right. Okay. This is the so people know this is the uh, the website here for Helicon. Again, I'll I'll put the link in for this one. But what I'm talking about here is that we've got three different packages, and I've, I'll be honest, I've not really had time to to read all about it. But you can see here Helicon Focus Light. I mean, it's a, it's good right. price. The only reason the only reason I've had to just load some images in is to get access to the other tabs. Light, uh, I think it's I can't remember. What I, I think I paid twenty pound a year for the light version. I didn't buy the lifetime license because I wanted to right. try it out. It does all the stacking you need, but you can't retouch. But if you're going right. into Photoshop okay. to do the retouching, then you don't need the pro version. What the right. pro version allows you to do. Let me stack this. This is going to be horrible, okay? Because these images I'll don't dive over to your screen, in fact, shall I? <laughs> yeah. In fact, this is a this is a good example of what happens when something moves. If you look, can you say <laughs> there's a big hole? Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of images do get thrown away, but what you can do in the pro version is you can select individual um, layers and retouch from those layers inside Helicon, but it is god awful slow. It really is. Um, right, okay. I much I much prefer to take the individual frames into Photoshop to, to retouch them. And again, okay. the only reason I went to Pro is because I'm teaching it on YouTube. So anyone who wants to All give right. it a go, wants to do, I'd say if you're doing more than, say, 10 images in a focus stack, mm -hmm. then try Helicon Focus and just go for the light because you can upgrade the license to a pro afterwards if you if you wish to. Cool, well. makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. All right, listen, I know yeah. that obviously we're, I'm, I'm conscious of how much that there is that you want to share. I'm conscious yeah, of I'll time, but I'm also conscious of the fact that we've had quite a lot of questions. So can we just take a moment just to dive through uh, some questions? Let's yes, just have a yes. see what kind of things we've got coming through. So let me just have a look here. I've actually used the button here. You can use your favourites. So I'll just randomly put through these things here, and I'll bring them up on the screen as well, so you can see some nice comments as well. Not, not surprisingly. Uh, hopefully, you can see these great guy called Tim Oliver. Stuart, if you've not met uh, Tim, check out Tim's handle on Instagram. Some beautiful bird photography. But uh, it's put amazing images, Stuart. You set the bar very high. I couldn't agree more with that one. Um, Keith yeah. Simpson did say Thank what you. stacking software. Obviously, we've covered that one. Another great comment here from my mate Ian Munro. Stuart, very talented man. Your work is pretty darn special. And that, Can I just interrupt you there and just say well done to Ian for being on time two weeks in a row? <laughs> hey, don't push it. He's just put a nice comment there. Uh, uh, Mark Payro Payroll. Mark, I hope I've said that <coughs> correctly there. Your tutorials were excellent and you always teach us a lot of exciting techniques for Photoshop. So that, that's great to hear. Oh, um, you, you, you wait till next year. <laughs> cool. No, right, there's some questions I've got some really here. good stuff planned. <laughs> Question here for my friend Trevor. He's put, um, interested that Stuart has a cold or hot shoe glued to his wireless transmitter. Yes. Is that I right? Have. Let's have a look here. Let's just yeah. dive back to you. So, if you look uh, right there, there's a cold oh, shoe oh, yeah, glued yeah. to my okay. transmitter. And if you Trevor, you're observing. While I make a lot of noise, get that off. Uh, I'll show you why I have that on there. And it's all to do with. Again, YouTube. 
I do get asked a lot of times to test out different lenses. And sometimes you get a lens that is just not compatible with the twin macro flash. So I haven't got the actual adapter with me to actually show it you. But when I've got a lens that's say uh, about that long, which there are, there's lower lenses out there that are very short. What mm -hmm. I can do is clip the flash onto the back there. So it's like that. Ah, oh, right. Okay. Yeah, because if it's uh, sometimes you just cannot get the light where you want it because you're so close to your subject. And what this enables me to do is just use the one flash above it because um, you can have the flash, you know, right at the end there. Can we see mm -hmm. that? Yeah. Yeah. Which it's too close to your subject and you get hot spots. So I like to back off the flash a little bit. So I literally stick it onto the end of there and that will accommodate any any lens. And I believe it was. Um, I remember what it was the lower 2.5 to 5 times macro lens fantastic lens but it's got a slight flaw that it has no filter ring on the end of it so you can't attach a twin macro flash to it mm. so i'll just glue, hot glue that onto the, i don't care i'll hot glue anything <laughs> hot glue is awesome. a, stick I mean, it on there a, i'm done that's a great question by trevor but equally quite scary that he even noticed it i must be very yeah it aware is actually you, quite, quite scary next time we're around you trev i'm going to be very wary very careful what i'm carrying and doing right um, great Ooh. question here from chris um our great mate chris he's put do you use the macro stacking in that medium uh, macro micro four thirds camera Stuart? no i don't um the only reason i don't is because i'm taking more than 15 images when you use the built-in focus stacking you're limited to 15 images on that particular camera and with the uh, om1 which is their latest camera mm -hmm. i prefer to get as many shots as possible because then i know i've got enough shots to deal with it which is why if we come back to lightroom um where was my images now yeah i showed you uh, an image where we have the flash that didn't go off Oh, that's right. So yeah, if yeah. I try and find that image, of course, I can't find it when I want to. Always the way. Always the We're way. We're about third anyway. row. On the, if I look in the grid there, the third row up on the right-hand side. Oh, that's just me taking a shot for the hell of it. Sometimes I just hit the shutter button for no reason. <laughs> oh, <yeah. Okay>. It <laughs> happens. <laughs> well, but yeah, like this here. So, um, so if I go to the one before, which is where the flash went off, it then fails and then goes again and i'm taking that many images and the steps between the focusing point is that small it doesn't matter all i do is just delete that image and there's enough information to carry on um, i haven't got a ruined stack from that if you was doing right. 15 shots and your flash failed it'll ruin the stack because there's not enough sure. uh, there's not enough detail between the steps and it's just in case someone's asked the band to ask my stepping um, distance is the minimum amount, which is one on the uh, the Olympus camera. And right, okay. I have set up preset for one, two, and three, depending on the size of the insect and your magnification and your distance. But generally, I'll just keep it on one now because you're okay. getting the most amount of data possible. And from there, you can call them out. Um, I don't always stack the whole sequence. So if I've got 100 images, well, yeah, if I've got 100 images, I might cut 10 from the beginning, 10 from the end right um because you don't want everything in focus you just want that select area but you've got there's, option if you do take more from than sure the 15. okay there's a there's a great question here from uh keith simpson because i always wondered this uh photographing insects in the wild how do you get those colorful backgrounds seamless plug okay background cards available from my website <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah um i literally i take these cards out Okay, so I'll just take the green one for now. And I'll just put that in the background. Now I use these when the background is ugly because background is important in macro. And you want a nice clean background. And sometimes you've got branches and stuff in there. So I'll just slip those in between. Um, I do use my Platypod system, which we haven't had time to talk about tonight. But there's loads of videos on my YouTube channel. And what right. I can do is just basically place the background into there and then that just basically holds there and the insects are here if they're on a branch of their own just put it in the background if not i can put it into this clump here oh so and, that's, the, uh, you that's your nice tripod there background. is it that's your tripod yeah it's called a platypod it's um it's the world's smallest tripod 
Okay. So if I get this off, there you go. That's the actual platinum pod itself. Oh, right. Okay. So yeah. You can put yeah. more on it and everything. But uh, another plus point to using this as well is if you've got a slightly breezy knife, which obviously you don't want when you're stacking, we can tuck this into a bush to stop the breeze. So then obviously my camera, my camera's on another platypod. So it's the same height, and it's just like a mobile macro studio. I call it. There's a there's this, a section uh, on this my live gear. broadcast yeah, isn't yeah. sponsored by Platypod as well. Just so you know, <laughs> I have a Platypod <laughs> Pro now, just to let you know. So it's got nothing to do with it. Cool. <laughs> I was so using Platypod gear before from, I got a Pro. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a question here from uh, my friend Gary Shaver. Again, just beautiful, beautiful images. Gary does. Uh, I've been chatting to Gary offline, trying to get him on the YouTube channel. And for the right reasons, he's not taking me up on it just yet. But folks, if you haven't checked it out, check out this guy's stuff, Gary Shaver. It is just stunning. Have a look at him on Facebook. But he said, did you add additional water mist to the early morning shot or was that natural dew? Good question. It's natural dew. It's natural dew. Okay. Uh, the conditions have to be right. You have to have a good dew point. Um, I'm, I'm not an expert in the weather. Literally... I'll just go out if it's good if it's good right. if it's not i'll just carry on photographing anyway uh, sure. but yeah i mean the dew can form very quickly i've got some shots on my instagram of flies where you can already see the dew forming and that was only 10 o'clock at night wow okay. you can spray it... them if you want to you can do that uh generally I, I, I tend to not to unless there's a creative reason to do so and yeah, it yeah. won't upset the insect um, right okay I, I prefer to not upset the insect as much as possible. I don't like tramping around in the undergrowth. I stick to the footpaths. Um, yeah, I, I, I have missed a couple of opportunities, but I'd rather not do that. It's just there's always another job. day, always another day for it. Yeah, there's a night, there's a, a useful comment here from uh, Andrew Lamberson. He's put both Helicon and Zarine offer a free test download. Uh, I think it's a good tr idea to try both. Absolutely, yeah. see what yeah. works. Uh, I am works actually, first. I have got a, a video coming up in hopefully a couple of weeks where i do put both of them side by side on a test to see which one is good mm -hmm. but i've done uh, it in the format of i'm not telling you which one's good it's up to you to look at the images yeah and yeah decide totally which one you like. yeah yeah steve perry he's put uh for the flash on camera could you use one of those portable soft boxes that fits over the flash anything that works to get soft light anything that works yeah. um just don't use bare flash <laughs> It's, it's sure. you know, you're not going to get good results with it. But yeah, um, there's lots of different things you can use for um, diffusing your flash. There's like um, budget friendly diffusers that are like three pound off Amazon. You can put those onto your lens. But generally, if you're going to take your macro seriously, and only if you're going to take it seriously, fork out for a good diffuser because mm -hmm. you, you, you buy an expensive camera, an expensive lens, get yourself a good diffuser. Um, yeah, definitely. And how <laughs> was it? Buy cheap, buy twice is what they say, isn't yes. it? Yes, if you buy cheap, you buy twice. I've gone through every every type of dif uh, diffuser you can think of. I've even made yeah. a Pringles can diffuser. And yes, you can make Pringles can diffusers, but they just suck, so don't bother. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. Listen, again, I'm very, very conscious of time, Stuart. I've got, I've got, I mean, I've actually taken some notes here while you were chatting about stuff. But one thing I do want to ask you about before we kind of think about wrapping this up in a few minutes uh, and you know, giving people the links to where they can go to find out more about what you're doing. It, the thing I'm really intrigued about now is mobile phones, mobile phone photography, because that's obviously becoming more and more prevalent. And we've got companies yeah. such as uh, Reflex and Moment and, and those kind of companies making macro lenses for use with mobile devices, your iPhones and your, your Androids and stuff. Mm -hmm. Have you got any thoughts on that? And And... Here's one out of the blue. Have you any examples of images that you've taken using a phone macro? Yes. If you uh, switch to my screen, I will show you one. Oh, here we go. <laughs> oh, we're cool. ready. All right. There we go. Um, so, yeah, th th this is a nice little slide I usually do at camera clubs just to guess the gear. And everyone's going, it's the Canon. Other people will say it's the, uh, the Olympus. But, in fact, it is an iPhone 12 Pro. And that's right. taken with the moment macro lens, yep. Moment macro lens with a little LED light, similar to what we have here, and a, again, custom-made bonnet diffuser. And I've got something else I haven't even shown Glenn yet. If you come back to my slide here, yeah. 
44 images that are being um, stacked here using method C, all of those are done on the iPhone. Every single one of those no is an way. iPhone image. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And wow. um, uh, it, obviously the iPhone doesn't have focused bracketing. Yeah. So what you want to do is you get yourself a, a little clip-on lens. They're very budget-friendly. I'm currently using an Apex or one because they sent it me and I didn't have to buy it. <laughs> Um, but we clip that on there like that. Uh, you can use the inbuilt app if you wish to, but generally I usually go into Lightroom, set a high shutter speed. I usually go around say 500, um, switch to a manual white balance because when you're stacking, you don't want auto white balance because it's going to adjust the colors. So right. stick it on a, a doesn't matter which one you select because you can adjust the colors in Lightroom afterwards. So long as it doesn't adjust, um, go to manual focus. And then all you do is you go into the burst mode, which in Lightroom is the volume buttons, which is awkward. Mm -hmm. um, you take your, your picture and you just slowly move the camera forward and bang. We're going to see seeing a lot of macro on phones next year. Yeah, um, yeah. And... I would recommend you buy one of these. What's that one you've got? Um... I use Reflex. So what you've got yeah. with the uh, with Reflex, they've actually got the clip, but their new G series <clears throat> is where you've got uh, anybody that's ordered one of the G series macros, whatever you get a uh, case as well. You get your choice of case, and they've got the apertures uh -huh. which are actually within where the lenses are, uh, yeah. which you can then screw the the macro or whatever lens you want uh, into yeah. that, so it's nice and snug. So yeah, um, and, and again. Light is key again. Um, if you can sort out your light, I'm currently using uh light with torches, uh, they're not in production no more, but I'm sure you can find an equivalent one out there. Um, to get the light onto your subject, and I was going to say, to say something. Oh, yeah, um, oh, look at this. Look at this. If you've got this, here, Stuart, Stuart, yeah, uh, Norman says camera pixels, which I presume is an app on iPhone, oh. has a focus bracket mode option. We'll have to check that out then, won't we? have to check that one out. Thank you, Norman. That sounds um, good. Yeah. Always like a recommendation. If, if your phone has a macro mode, I would suggest not to use it. Mm -hmm. uh, get a clip-on lens because I was in the free mobile store today doing research for this very live. So I was playing with their iPhone 15 Pro Max. And as soon as it goes into macro mode, it's flipping to the 12 megapixel ultra-wide camera, which just sucks. Yes. Yeah. Um, so always get a clip on lens and use that main camera, which is, I think, 48 megapixels, is it? But don't be it put is, off yeah. with it, that because I am still using the 12 Pro. Um, but you know, Stuart, the, the only problem with so, this is at the moment, and this is, an, this is an Apple issue, when you, obviously, we all want to use that 1X lens, the 48 megapixel, get the biggest raw yeah. file, the biggest detail we can. But if we're diving into our software, we put the lens over, we put the macro lens on it, so we're, we're able to get macro from that 1X lens. But if we then adjust any settings within that camera app, ISO, shutter speed, whatever, it then jumps from 48 megapixels to 12. If you just leave yeah. it as it is, it'll be fine. But for some reason, this is obviously, I, I can't, there must be some good reason for it, I would hope. Yeah. You, but it jumps from 48 to 12 if you adjust any of the auto settings. Crazy. Yeah. You just, you just want a camera app that you can just lock it out. Um, again, this is something I'm kind of experimenting with. I think I'm going to be doing a lot of it um, next year. So subscribe if you want to see those images. <laughs> well, yeah, on that, on that note, on that note, because uh, yeah. I am going to wrap this up now, Stuart, and I can't, I you, seriously you can't. One more one more oh, minute, on, because then. I did notice on, the then. chat people talking about how expensive macro lenses are. You don't oh, need sure. to buy a macro okay. lens, okay? Um, you can buy one of these. This is a Rhinox DCR 250. It's like a magnifying glass for your lens. So if you want to, you know, if, you, if you've been inspired to try macro tonight, but you don't want to put the dollar down on buying new gear, this is only like £50, I think, if I remember right. Um, and you literally... Yeah, you literally just clip it on to the wow. front of your lens, and that that will turn your uh, normal lens into a macro lens. And the longer the focal length, the better you'll get. So if you've got a seventy two hundred, bang that on, you're good. And 
The other thing you can get is macro extension tubes. And I know we're going a little bit over eagling, but no, if you just show my right. screen one minute. Sure. Okay, yeah. Just to show you. There you go, mate. Um, I want you to take note of the camera settings in that image. That is a Canon EOS 650D with a 50 millimeter plastic fantastic on extension tubes. <laughs> and, okay. and it's the pop-up flash. Wow. So yeah, um, again, the diffuser is the important one. It's actually the same diffuser that's on my twin macro flash. I just held it on while I was doing it. And you can start macro with very budget friendly gear. You can start it with the gear you've got in your bag right now. Just get yourself some extension tubes or a clip on lens or a lens for your phone. You're good to go. That's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Stuart, I seriously, I knew this was going to be good. And I listening to this now and watching all the stuff and you talking about it, you're making it to me, you make it feel so accessible. Do you know what I mean? It's, it, you make yeah. me want to go out and try it, basically, is what I'm saying. Do you know what I mean? So I'm definitely going to give it a go. I wish I hadn't sold that <laughs> macro lens I had for me, Sony. But hey, um, I, I can't thank you well, enough. I know you've put a lot of effort um, into this to put stuff together. So brilliant. Don't need a Sony yeah. lens. You got your, yeah, I'm with you. Phone. I'm totally with you. I'm totally yeah. with you on that. Stuart, when it comes to uh, links, obviously, I'm going to put some stuff in the description part of this video. I want people to go to your website, your YouTube yeah. channel, as well, but your Instagram is damn good. It is seriously Thank good, you. you Instagram channel. So folks, definitely, definitely tune into that. But have you got like a, I don't know, and you're in your keynote that you really can't put, have you got a page there with some links on that we can quickly show up or is there yep. anything at all? That, yeah, let me just dive over to your screen. Any social media account and type in at Stuart Wood Art, it'll bring me up because I've got the same, the same handle for everything, which makes it very easy for people to find me. Superb. Absolutely superb. Folks, I can see from the comments, I mean, Tim's there just put down that, you know, excellent session, Glenn Stewart. Th thank you for that, Stuart. And, you know, you. there's loads of other comments coming in there as well. Mark's put in there. So I'm I'm so glad we managed to get you on there. I think this will probably be the yeah. last live that I do this side of 2024. But I said, like, next year we're going to be kicking off more. So I, I couldn't have wished for a better one to finish this off because with everybody having a bit of time now, then maybe people having time out from work, this could be something they can go out and try, give it a bit of a go. And what I love about this macro stuff, Stuart, is, is me as a portrait photographer who's also diving out there and doing stuff, you know, the landscapes and seascape stuff with my yeah. phone. If you ever find yourself with nothing to photograph, I guess you could just go into your back garden. There'll always be something to yeah. photograph with the macro. Yeah, I'm always in the back garden. I really am. Yeah. Um, uh, one thing I would say is if you go out in the garden at, say, nine-ish at night, you can actually pinpoint where the insects are going to sleep. So when you wake up, you can go and look around, you know exactly where they are. <laughs> Somebody did <laughs> ask that, actually. Good point. Them. Somebody asked that when you, and this is the last thing to ask you, but when you go out early hours of the morning, and it's dark, like two in the morning. Mm. How are you finding the insects? Well, uh, it's probably a really silly, silly question. You've probably got a torch or something. That's what you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just I just go with with the torch. You just um, shine around in in the region. You know roughly where they're going to be because you've already scouted out the area. Um, but you know, if you've got a a bright green um, emerald damselfly, it, it sticks out when you're trying right, to talk okay. because it's, it's reflecting stuff. Other stuff is hard to find. You can find lots of spiders, lots of spiders at night, mm. but a lot of them are nocturnal, so they're moving around. Um, oh, right, okay, yeah, good point. Just go, out, just go out there and have a look, and you know, you'll start getting fascinated. But you'll start getting fixated on a certain species, and you just want to get that species. Like next year, I really want to get dragonflies. Uh, I might have to get a new lens for that, though. That's the problem. <laughs> oh, no, here we go. Here we go. Listen, just to, just to finish off, then, you've got a lovely comment here from Lenny. Lenny's put this. She'd followed you for years. Uh, your photos are amazing. I've learned a ton from you. So that's a, oh, a real Thank you very much. Thank high, you very much. High five up there. And then you've got my mate Steve Healy. Steve, who we're going to catch up with soon. Many thanks to you both. Most enjoyable and educational. Couldn't ask for more. Yeah. Stuart. I've had to try and fit in a lot in the air, but if you want um, more information, just go over to my YouTube channel. It's all Absolutely. There. The okay. links will be in the description. But Stuart, thank you so, so much. Uh, folks, you'll be thank seeing you a lot more me. of Stuart. So, no, you're welcome. All righty. So, folks, again, thank you so much for joining me for this week's uh, YouTube Live. The format seems to be working. People seem to be liking this. So, if you want to see... Uh, more of this let me know if there's anybody out there that you'd like to see me get on here let me know and we can get them on for the hour as well so I'm really liking this kind of format but 
you know, it's only uh, another, was it another, one more sleep until the big man comes. So uh, I hope you're all ready for Christmas. I hope you don't eat too much, but enjoy yourselves. If you've got some time off work, then great. If you're working, don't work too hard. Uh, and I will definitely see you uh, soon. See you live. Same here, same place, same time. We're going to stick to seven o'clock on, on a Sunday. Or what day is it today? Is it Sunday? Oh, I don't know. Anyway, it's going to be the weekends. I'll keep you posted. Join the newsletter. You'll get to know when they're coming out. But folks, Merry Christmas. And thank you so much for the support over the last 12 months. Thank <laughs> you.